All right, uh, next up is the uh, very entertaining Kent Leedstrom. Welcome up. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Basse. Now he's putting pressure on me to be entertaining. That's always a bit scary start. Um, anyway, uh, I will start to give you some an update from uh, the trade show that I went to last week down in, uh, in San Diego, California, and uh, give you some uh, some update on the latest and greatest news and trends around the optical industry. Starting with OFC, so what is it? Well, it's the Optical Fiber Communication Conference. It takes place every year. It is the biggest uh, conference uh, for our industry, basically going through uh, all the aspects of, uh, um, I mean, components for the optical industry, uh, sub-assemblies, uh, components, and last but not least, systems around optics. Uh, so in that venue, you have, of course, uh, uh, kind of an exhibition. Uh, here you see a picture of us standing in front of our booth demonstrating our equipment for customers. So that is a very, very large area with uh, everything that you can ever imagine around fiber uh, stuff. Um, a lot of things that you have a hard time to figure out what they're going to be used for. It is also a, uh, uh, say a fairly several different conference or presentations going on in, in the meantime. There are also a number of work groups uh, working with kind of educational stuff, uh, so you can get a lot of information in, in, uh, during this week. Uh, this is, of course, let's say, kind of an event where you get together and meet people. So, of course, there is room for some fun activities as well. So, of course, um, lots of dinners and drinks uh, during that time. And when you travel across the globe, uh, you, of course, want to take the opportunity to have some fun. So a little bit of that as well got, um, got into the schedule. So overall, it was a very, very good session. So this year was the first year now since 2019 where, say, everyone participated. Last year, it was still difficult for the Chinese and for the, for the um, uh, um, Asian vendors to travel. But now everyone were, I say, there, and it was, um, uh, I say, a really good show. So there are two uh, takeaways that I want to um, go through here, and I'm going to try to be objective. I am, however, going to be slightly biased because I meet customers and uh, suppliers that are talking about, uh, say, some, uh, some topics that is kind of related to what we do at Smart Optics. But the first takeaway is related to the coherent optical transceiver. Uh, so the, this area has been talked about on those conferences for quite some time, but there are a few things that we noticed that has really changed in the dynamics on this market. First of all is that the OEF for ZR and OpenZR is becoming a very, very crowded place. There are at least 15 different suppliers today and manufacturers that develop uh, those products. There are, I mean, the traditional DWM uh, transceiver manufacturers like uh, the uh, Finisar and uh, Lumentum of the Worlds. Uh, we also see some new uh, players in this uh, area with uh, the DWM system vendors, now also developing components like the Infineras and uh, Siennas. And then you have the component manufacturers that are trying to move up the food chain that owns some of the technology behind it, like Marvell, for example, that is now also developing modules. And last but not least, the traditional uh, gray optics manufacturer InnoLite, AC-Link, that has typically been uh, developing and uh, manufactured high volumes of the standard uh, gray optics. Now they are also moving into this space with 400ZR optics. And why is this possible all of a sudden? Is this because the technology is easy and everyone can do it? No, it is super difficult and very advanced technology. However, what has happened is that the uh, say the, the philosophy and the strategy for many of the companies have changed. There are say three main building blocks, a uh, complicated building blocks into one of those uh, modules. Uh, it used to be uh, the secret source for each company that could develop it. They never share that information. Now you can buy those sub assemblies and put together your own module if you wish to do so. So those three components are the DSP, the digital signal processor. That is three or four suppliers that develop those, but everyone can source them and use them in their uh, modules. You have the uh, silicon uh, coherent optical sub-assembly uh, that uh, contains uh, the uh, modulator and uh, uh, photo de uh, detector uh, within silicon photonics. So it's 
Very complicated stuff, but it's now possible to source. And last but not least, the Nano ITLA, the Integrated Tunable Laser Assembly that allows you to shoot the reference laser with the right wavelengths into both the receiver and transmitter. So uh, now you can actually buy and source all of those and package them together and build your own module. So that's why it's all of a sudden now has changed so much and there are so many alternatives out there to do this. So uh, does that mean that everyone does the same thing or is, the, is there any room for improvement and innovation in this area? Well, of course it is. So uh, those are the standards that I'm talking about here. But if we look at what's happening beyond the standards, we are now seeing modules coming out, actually becoming GA this month, uh, the first modules with high TX power. So the traditional open setup plus optics have had a TX power of minus 10 dB. That limit their use case into existing networks. With these type of new optics, you can actually run them into existing Rodan networks. You can run them in even 50 gigahertz based uh, networks because they do have new modulation formats that will fit that bandwidth. So you can uh, repurpose and reuse your network for a longer time, even utilizing the new type of optics. This is something that our customers have been waiting for for a long time. It's going to change uh, completely how those optics can be used over existing networks. We also see more advanced optics coming out later this year, second half of this year, that are capable to handling uh, OTN framing on the client side and on the line side. They also support layer one encryption and uh, uh, they, uh, you can also use them and get access to the inbound management channel, even in the QCP DD form factor. So this allows for remote management and also get encryption uh, built in into the optics. The OTN piece there, it is not that important for the IP over DWM because you can have Ethernet directly in the switch router. But if you build transponders and max bonders with the, say, the QCP DD on the line side, you can now utilize and be compliant with the open road and specification and map in different OTN frame rates as well. Then we have the reach that everyone are pushing for. Uh, if you uh, looked at um, uh, different press releases from last, uh, last week, uh, Infinera announced two new world record uh, during OFC where they pushed their 400 gig optics across uh, 2,400 kilometers in lab network and 1,800 into a, uh, an existing network in the field. So those are extremely impressive numbers, of course, but that is also based on the fact that it's a state-of-the-art uh, uh, line system used with uh, the best optical performance on the market, uh, uh, hybrid drum and amplifiers and everything, etc. So in a standard existing network, you will not see that distance, but it's possible to use this and push them much further. There are also other techniques to do it with probabilistic shaping. You can also go into different uh, um, modulation formats. We will see long haul versions of the 400 gig coming out uh, early next year that can go uh, very long distances, even on 400 gig in the same form factor. So it's a, an evolving technology where the I would say that suppliers that owns the technology behind can be more innovative and come up with better solutions. Last but not least, we also see that uh, the new optics allows you to uh, use for more flexible uh, topologies. It used to be more as a point to point. That was the initial design for them. You have 400 gig on one side, 400 gig on the other side. You book in them the traditional way you would do with a transponder. But now we see optics here coming out uh, supporting the MLG. Uh, Frame formatting, that means you can do a simple uh, multiplexer. We have, for example, a 4 by 100 gig multiplexer into 400 gig using MLG multiplexing. You run that into 400 gig optics, and you can terminate it directly in a 400 gig router port on the other side. So that means you can build non-symmetrical networks where you have lower rate on one side with full clock transparency, terminated into a higher end port, doing it in layer one, which is kind of a new way of building networks. So that's a really cool thing. Then you have the, uh, the SAB carrier technology based on the uh, Open XR forum, uh, where they do this point to multipoint, created a lot of interest uh, around uh, that technology at OSC last week. So these are some of the new innovations. Uh, if we look a little bit broader on the coherent optics, uh, what else did we see? Well, this is an uh, other really, really interesting little beast that are now finally coming alive. So the coherent 100 gig into a QSFP 
28 form factor. I would say the market's been waiting for this for quite some time. Uh, now we have uh, one supplier that will come out end of the year. We have another press release and announcement for a uh, uh, second supplier that have also committed to do this. And for me, it's absolutely amazing to see that they can do a coherent 100 gig within that small form factor with less than 5 watt power dissipation. It is super impressive that uh, that can be done. Uh, that will, of course, open up for new um, applications. You can start to use kind of low-cost, coherent 100 gig into uh, passive networks with pretty good performance. And it will also be possible to start to push uh, 100 gig uh, coherent further out into the access. There is, of course, a lot of talk about using this into the, into the access network, 5G, mobile backholding, etc. We are very excited about this and think it's going to... Uh, open up a lot of new opportunities to build networks. Um, so this is a cool uh, evolution. So this is going down in bit rates. Uh, what's happening in the other direction? So uh, we will start to see uh, the first uh, coherent uh, 800 gig pluggable units coming out in sampling this year and uh, going GA first half next year. They will be based on the I say, 800 gig 16 quad modulation. So in order to go from 400 gig to 800 gig, you could either uh, change or increase the modulation format, going from 16 quam to 64 quam, or uh, you maintain the same modulation format and increase the board rate. That's what they have done in this case now, based on the OF specification. So maintain 16 quam, but increase the board rate so you maintain the same optical performance as 400 gig. So basically, if you've designed your network to support 400 gig from an OSNR point of view, you will be able to deal with the same type of performance on the 800 gig side. So quite, quite a good way to, um, to uh, build the strategy for the next generation. So this is uh, getting very close to be, uh, be finalized in the definition. It will come out in the standard form factor, QCP, DD, OSFPs, and CP2. If we take one step beyond that, uh, right now no one really demonstrates 1.6 terabit units. Uh, that is probably due somewhere 2025. Uh, 1.2 terabit units in slightly different uh, form factors were demonstrated at OSC. But next step is expected to be for on the pluggable and MSA side on the, on the uh, 1.6 terabit unit. There has been a lot of debate on form factors in this area. Uh, we I mean, if I would have been standing here six months ago, I would have said that it will be an OSFP uh, XD that is required to do 1.6 terabit. Now there seem to be some uh, really, really strong drivers not to use uh, OSFP for some of the vendors. So they are bending and turning every stone. So now it seems to be technologically feasible to go one to 1.6 with QCP DD. Exactly what it's going to look like, I don't really know yet, but. Yeah, more to come in that question, but it's uh, still quite far out. But uh, what we see here is that there is a, a, a con constant ongoing development around uh, this technology. So that was the first observation on, on it. So a lot of new vendors and a lot of new flavors around this. So a very, very interesting uh, development. The next trend that we saw was related to the WSSs. Uh, the WSS, I'll start with some uh, quick educational part there. The WSS, that's a wavelength selective switch. It is the key component in a RODEM uh, unit. So you need WSSs to build your network. A WSS uh, module works with, I say, it's a quite advanced technology inside. I simplified it with just a simple block staying uh, WSS. But what it does is that it route individual wavelengths or actually individual spectrum out from one common port into one out of many ports. The n number of ports there, that's typically defined on how many degrees or how many ports you have. In this case, you have one common port where you can take, a, say, a consolidated number of wavelengths and then steer them and individually switch them into one of those five output ports. They can be used in both directions, so you can have a, a, the incoming traffic switched out to one common port, and you can take a common port and switch them out to uh, uh, each individual, um, say, sub-port. So this is kind of the key component. What we see as a trend there is that the number of WSS ports are increasing with new technology, new, new evolution in that area, and we expect it to continue that way for some time. Why is this important and how are those technologies applied? If we look at the RODAM, they can be used in many different topologies. It can be used in simple point-to-point. -point. I will come back to 
why th that could be, say, interesting also with a new technology. They can be used in chain applications where uh, you can run traffic from site A to B, uh, or one to two, two to three, but also uh, from one to three, and just uh, route the wavelengths that you want to bypass here through, so you only have to go with the data from there to there. Ring networks will provide you with an any-to-any -any capability, so you can now go with uh, wavelengths from here to any other site in the network, uh, either way or the, in the ring. And then last but not least, the most complicated part here is in a mesh network. There you can route a wavelength from any site uh, to any other site in any direction through the network, as long as you have a appropriate OSNR and so on to, to fulfill that, uh, that requirement. So these are the kind of line configuration that you want to use the rodents for. This is what they've been used for all along the time, so nothing really new here. Uh, what's, uh, say, added in value with the new technology, with a new number of ports, is primarily around the add drop structure. So I will go through some of those buzzwords. I'm not going to spend a lot of educational time here, but you have what people refer to as colorless direction, as contention, as flex grid rodents. That's the ultimate goal that everyone would like to have uh, because it adds a lot of, say, cool benefits into your network. A colorless port, that means you can take a wavelength uh, or a, a pluggable optics with any wavelength and run it, run, route it into or connect it to any port. So there is no court, uh, port wavelength uh, dependency. Directionless, that means you take your wavelengths, in this case lambda 1, you go through your add drop structure and you route it either that direction or that direction. That little or is very important here. If you go to a contentionless, you can take lambda 1, go through your add drop unit in that direction and in that direction. Then little or and and can be an order of magnitude difference in price. I'm talking hundreds of times more expensive. So to do this, you typically use a simple copy unit for a couple of hundred dollars. To do that in a larger network, you need to use um, some kind of... Um, either optical switch structure, it can be WSS based, it can be based on different technologies, you have to pre-amplify it, so it can easily, one of those units can easily be $20,000 just to achieve that. The new generation optics or WSSs that comes out now on the market will allow you to do this in a much more cost-efficient manner. So that's why it's really, really uh, interesting and important evolution of that technology side. To do multi-port WSSs has been difficult from especially the size point of view. Now it's becoming, it's shrink, shrinking and becoming usable in a slot in unit. And last but not least, flex grid. You can take a unit with any uh, frequency spectrum uh, width and uh, map it into the WSS port with just the appropriate bandwidth that you require for that signal. So that means you can utilize uh, or get an optimized uh, uh, spectral efficiency onto your fiber into the network. So this is basically the different configurations. So the new trends that we see is the number of ports are increasing. Pretty much everyone are now coming out or have already released th uh, twin 34 port WSS. That means you have one common line coming in here, goes out, you can steer each part of the spectrum out to any of those 34 ports in this direction. And uh, you connect it typically the same way in the other direction. You take the 34 ports here and combine the wavelengths that you want to use or the spectrum into this common port. When you put it together, you typically put it together in a rhodium unit with amplifiers, with channel monitoring capabilities, OSC channel, uh, maybe an OTDR, etc. So this is typically how you build your network. Those additional ports that you have here now, you have a lot of add drop ports, capable, uh, uh, ports with capability of doing add drops or cross connect. I'll show you an example of that here uh, shortly. And uh, with this number of ports, you can now start to use each port for a local add drop. That means you have um, uh, some advantages that you will see of it, but we will also see coming out next year even bigger uh, number of ports into the WSS environment uh, that allows you to do even more funny things with your configuration. Uh, looking at what this gives, it gives you the possibility to uh, add and drop channel directly onto a WSS port. So that means you don't ne uh, necessarily need to use any filter, copper structure behind it. Uh, you get an, uh, say an appropriate amount of WSS port to use them as your local add drop. 
of course, you can combine it and build them also with, uh, uh, with Cross Connect. Uh, you can now use every port for whatever you want. So you have the full flexibility on every single port that you add and drop traffic to set up um, exactly how much spectrum you want to use for that particular port. So then you can, in a very say, uh, innovative way, come up with new ways of deliver both services and also uh, wavelengths. And last but not least, then, uh, it gives you a very, very elegant way of building a full CDCF without adding a lot of cost to it. So if we put this into a product, what it, does it look like? You typically have one Rodam unit in a two-degree node. You typically have one of those in west-facing direction, one east-facing direction. You will use one of those WSS ports for your cross-connect, uh, southbound, northbound, or east and west. The remaining 33 ports you can use for local ad drop, and you can also use them in a, uh, in a very simplified way for, for full CDCF as well. So that becomes quite handy to build uh, advanced ad drop structure at a, at a very reasonable price point. Uh, so this is, of course, something we are investing in, and we will build a product uh, uh, like this uh, with 34 degree. One other interesting thing that I see from the customers I speak to is that many customers today are actually considering using something like this even for point-to-point -point line systems. Because that means if they put this into a point-to-point, -point, no ambition to use cross-connect and use it as a RODAM, you get every add and drop onto a full flex grid port. So you are, I would say, to what we know today, I should say, we are completely future-proof with everything that you can ever imagine when it comes to spectral bandwidth on, uh, onto each port for the future. So we see actually quite a bit of interest in that application. It's a more expensive part than do it with a filter-based structure, but still it uh, adds, uh, uh, say, a future-proofness that makes people sleep well. So this is, of course, one thing that we, as Smart Optics, think is a pretty cool idea. One other thing that kind of surprised us when it comes to trend was that uh, we see that every single supplier are also building a unit uh, that is, say, combined this way. That means you have a 4x34 port WSS. And the reason why it's, as I say, typically built this way is to build a lower cost two degree Rodom site. You get everything integrated into one module to, uh, say, dry down costs, basically. So I, I do see a lot of benefit from this from a cost point of view and from a maybe also technology integration point of view. But you do, however, uh, build a product that's going to sit in a strategic point with, with I say, basically the entire thing becomes a single point of failure. This is uh, an area that we had not really, say, considered doing because we haven't never had those kind of requirements from customers. So I was kind of surprised when every single supplier of WSS says they are building this because they see a demand for it. So I'm really curious to understand your view on this. So, I mean, look me up afterwards. So if you see customer requirements or that you are considering use this, this kind of com components, I'm really interested to understand that and how you... Um, Say, so come to that conclusion to put every, I mean, everything into one single point of failure into a strategical site. So um, this is definitely something that happen happens. Uh, we have certainly not made a decision to go that right. Uh, probably you can hear that I'm not really convinced that this is the way to build it, but uh, uh, I would like to see if someone can convince me that this is a good idea. That was basically my last slide around the trends. There are, of course, a lot of other things that came up in, in those discussions, but I would say those were the two main things that kind of caught our eyes, that everyone seems to go in, in one certain direction. So, thank you. Uh, hello. Um, so, the, but the WSS uh, 64 and 96 port, what's the driver for that? Most of the channels are going wider and wider. Uh, so, if you go back one more slide, you said next year there would be 64 and 96 port modules. What's the driver for this if the channels are going wider and you're going to run out of spectrum anyway? Uh, it's because you get more, I say, if you do this in a uh, CDC structure. Uh, you're going to have in a two-degree site, now you have 64 ports to connect in two directions. If you go into four degrees, you still have only the 64 to play with. So it provides higher, say, local ad drop capability in a multi-direction multi fashion. Okay, thank you.
Not so funny, but thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Ken. <Kat. laughs>